Today, we'll be brushing up our rendezvous skills with the contract Build a New Orbital Station Around the Moon. This tutorial is the second of two parts. In part one, we looked at building large rockets when we inserted about the moon a module holding 4,000 units of liquid fuel. In this video, we'll be completing and crewing our station. As the first module is in a polar orbit about the moon, the central focus of this video will be in how to perform the rendezvous. I'll be looking at two techniques, one that saves fuel while the other saves time. That way you can choose which works better for you in your missions. We will also be taking a look at the build and I will show you how to use the game's subassembly feature to construct a booster library, something that will greatly speed up your builds. Let's get started. And once again, we'll start off by taking a quick look at the contract, build a new orbital station around the moon because we do want to make sure we are aware of our expectations. So for instance, if I go down a little bit here, we have uh, an expectation, have 4,000 units of liquid fuel in our station. That's what we did last episode. That's the hardest part of this one, honestly, is to get all of that fuel that is sitting up there in orbit about the moon. All we have to do now is put on the rest of the station. So taking a look at all the rest of this, we have build a new station. It has to have an antenna docking port and generate power. The station must be fully assembled when launched. I got some very useful comments last episode letting me know that this point is only in reference to the previous point. In other words, only the antenna docking port and power generation need to be all in the same vehicle. To me, that's confusing, but the short of it is that all the rest of this can still be done in multiple modules. So onward, we have to be able to support at least 11 Kerbals, we have to have two pilots on the station, and we must maintain stability for 10 seconds, and have that station obviously in orbit about the moon. So let's get started with the rest of our station build. So right here is what we put up last episode in orbit about the moon. So now what we need to do is complete the rest of our station. I have the contract requirements over here because I want to make sure that I do not miss anything. And I also am building in the space plane hangar because I do like this ability to slide left and right. It makes building things like stations and bases, I think, much, much easier. So we'll just start building off of this docking port. So we'll get a matching docking port there put that onto here and now what I'd like to do is build a sort of docking hub on this I'm gonna go into structural I do have this little micro node that has nodes all over it but is way too small for this there is a bigger version of this but it is pretty heavy and what I kind of like to do and I think it looks good too is just to grab structural fuselage it's only a hundred kilograms stick that on there and then I'm gonna grab another one Put it on here sideways make sure the snap is on and then i'm going to rotate it that way and i'm going to get it so it looks like it's about in the middle just like that uh and then we're going to use the translate tool going to grab that make sure our snap is off we're going to slide that so it looks good right in the middle that way i think that's pretty good and then we'll grab it and slide it towards the middle this way as well and now what we got is a very nice little hub happening here and if you want in fact what I'm exactly going to do is I'm going to do the exact same thing up here on the top put the snap on flip it so that it is that way perfect okay again we're going to get the translation tool and we're just going to slide make sure the snap is off slide it like that and like so and then we got a nice little hub here, which we can now surround with docking ports. So as we attach more modules, we have a very handy little place to put them. If you're having trouble with them snapping to the nodes, remember to hold the Alt key. That helps with that. There we go, that looks great. Okay, let's get another 
structural fuselage. So we'll build this out a little further, again, holding the Alt key. And then on the end of that, I'm gonna put in some reaction wheels. It is a good idea to have your station have some independent control, especially as it gets bigger. So a set of reaction wheels to help keep your station's attitude consistent is a good idea. And then I'm going to go back into structural. I'm gonna grab one of these Rockamax brand adapter twos. We're gonna put that right on the end of that. And I wanna put on a whole stack of batteries. So I'm actually gonna grab these Z100 batteries put the snap on, go all the way to, oh, I'm on radial symmetries, go off of that, go all the way to eight-way symmetry, right there, and then I'm gonna grab those, stay on eight-way symmetry, zoom in a little bit, take the snap off so I can slide these right in between, so we got 16 batteries there, there we go. The rest of this was pretty straightforward, I put on two Hitchhiker cans, which brings the crew capacity up to eight. I know the contract requirement is for 11, but the vessel that will be bringing the crew to the station has seats for three. Don't forget, everything that's docked with the station counts. And I also took advantage of all the inventory slots in the hitchhikers and put in eight of these strut connectors. I'll show you at the end of the video how I plan on using those, as well as three repair kits. Repair kits can be used to repair things like broken solar panels or antennas, but each repair does use up a kit, so it's good to have multiple ones aboard. I then put on another Rocco Max adapter, a service bay inside which I put a hex probe core, a Z200 battery, and a communitron so that this thing can fly autonomously. And then to finish this off, I put on one more of these structural fuselages with a docking port at the end of it. And on the structural fuselage, I put two OX-4L 1x6 solar panels to power this thing. And then of course I had to put on some lights. I put on a total of eight of these lovely little spotlights to light up the station, as well as a whole periphery of other navigation lights that you are free to tag on at your own discretion. Now it's time to get, start thinking about getting this thing to the moon, and that means getting into the vehicle assembly building. So I'm gonna select this docking port here as my root part. We're gonna get rid of this for now, and we're going to switch over to the vehicle assembly building and I want this oriented with the docking hub down because that's the heaviest part of the payload and more or less centered in this circle that's in the floor of the VAB that will make moving the camera around easier as well you kind of want it centered on the launch pad because it sort of looks goofy when you don't do that and then we need to get this thing cleaned up for its journey out into space. So up on the top, I did a very familiar thing by now. I put a 1.25 meter fairing upside down and attached that to the docking port and then built the fairing downwards to enclose all of this. And then attached to the fairing, I put a single separatron, took out almost all of the fuel and then moved it towards the center but not exactly in the center because you kind of want it off center a little bit so that when this thing deploys, it will go off to the side of the vehicle. Then I finish this off with an advanced nose cone. So that takes care of the top. Let's move down to the other end where I put on a service bay inside which I put a hex probe core and made that the root part so that this hex probe will be the default control point for the vehicle. I don't know which way the probe body in the space station is oriented anymore. And then attached to that, I put on a Z200 battery and a communitron antenna so that this transfer vehicle on the bottom will also be autonomous so that after I complete the station, if I want to deorbit the transfer vehicle, I got it out there, I can do that. And I'm gonna to need to have RCS on this thing in order to dock it with the fuel module that's already there. So I put on an FL-R120 RCS fuel tank. And then to clean up this whole bottom end, I grabbed a 2.5 meter fairing and then built the fairing so that it can close in around the hitchhiker can. And because the docking port is a very flimsy connection, I wanna shore this up with four strut connectors. 
And just like last episode, I'm going to take advantage of the recently unlocked custom action groups and attach a bunch of things to some action groups. And I'm going to use action group zero for all of the deployable stuff. So that includes both service bays, antennas, and solar panels. And on action group five, I'm going to do everything associated with the fairing. So that's both fairings, which I then removed from the staging, that top docking port that the nose cone is attached to, and the separatron that's going to blast away said nose cone. And the advantage of doing all of this separation with an action group as opposed to using the staging diagram is that I don't have to guess where in the staging diagram all this should go. In flight, I can stage this whenever I want just by pressing 5 on my keyboard. And now we come to the point where we finally have to add on some fuel and some propulsion, and that means a Delta V budget. But this vehicle is going to the exact same location as the vehicle from last episode, so it's going to have the exact same Delta V budget. So for the transfer vehicle, I once again wanted a Delta V between 1,140 meters per second and 2,140 meters per second. And what got me into that ballpark was a Rockomax X200-16 fuel tank underneath of which went the RE-1110 Poodle liquid fuel engine. If I take a look at my statistics and put this on vacuum, that gets me a delta V of 1,882, which is in the range I want. Thrust to weight of 1.34, which is more than adequate. We can change the textures because I do like that one so much better. This thing also needs some RCS thrusters, so we're gonna go over to control here. We're gonna grab the RV-105 RCS thruster block. These are the bigger ones, because this is kind of a big boy. We're gonna put four of them down here. Now you wanna center your RCS thrusters around the center of mass of the vehicle, which means we're gonna put some of them up here. Uh, also though, remember that most of this fuel is gonna be used up during our ascent and during our transfer out to the moon. So let's actually get rid of all of this extra weight that we really aren't going to have on here. And then we'll grab these again. And approximately is going to be good enough. We'll put them right about there. Put those ones along the same way. If you want to take this into orbit and really balance the RCS, by all means, you are free to do that. But with the reaction wheels in here, this is going to be perfectly fine. And don't forget to put on those actuation toggles and toggle off the yaw pitch and the roll that will save you a lot of monopropellant. This is now something that we should be able to get to the moon now. What we need to do is get this thing into Kerbin orbit. And again, total budget for this, same as last time, it's gonna be about 5,000 meters per second. Now, I'm gonna save this because I wanna show you something that really helps to save time on your build. Make sure that you have advanced mode toggled on and go to sub assemblies I got a number of boosters and these are all boosters that I've used in previous ones so if I for instance grab the first one here this is a little tiny booster one of the first ones that I made clearly that's not going to work but what's really nice is if you save these that allows you to simply grab an old booster, slap it on there, and really save your build. So all of these boosters came from previous builds in this series. I've also written on here how much payload they're capable of getting into low carbon orbit. I'll show you how I make these by taking our booster from last episode and adding it to this list. So this is clearly the largest thing we have built so far. Let's add that as a booster number 10 to the list of boosters that we have here. So the first thing you wanna do is get rid of the payload part. So you take the reroute tool, go and find that decoupler that's attaching your payload to the rocket. And I guess that would be here. Here it's attached by a docking port. So right there, I'm gonna make that the root part and that's gonna allow me to simply grab the payload part and chuck that away because I really don't care about that. This is the piece that I want to save. Now, if I take a look at my total Delta V, it is 100% through the roof because we lost all of that payload. I mean, 8,691 meters per second. I wanna get an idea how much mass this thing can really get into orbit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to my fuel cans, grab the biggest fuel can that I have and add that onto the top. Now, I don't wanna include this fuel in this Delta V calculation. So I'm gonna right click on it. We're gonna turn that fuel off. Now this is just 
mass. And you can see that that brought my delta V down 6,632. I've been budgeting 3,800 to get into low carbon orbit. If you wanna budget less than that because you're getting better at putting things in orbit, by all means do that. But what I'm gonna do is keep adding mass until our delta V drops below 3,800. And don't worry about the aerodynamics. It's not like we're actually gonna lift this thing. All we care about is mass. Note that these are always turning back on, so I just gotta keep making sure that they keep turning off. Now I'm at 38, 3686, that's too low. So what I'm gonna do now is start removing liquid fuel and oxidizer until I'm around 3800 meters per second. So if it's, uh, now I can see I've, gone, I've taken off too much, the so delta V is too high, so we'll add in a bit more, add in more. 3812, that feels pretty good to me. So this big chunk of stuff, if I completely ignore aerodynamics, this thing is capable of lifting into orbit. Okay, so how much mass is that? Well, to find that out, get your reroute tool again, grab the bottom tank. This now allows you to grab this booster and remove it, put it over here to the side. You can go over to your engineer's report and you can see that this is 100.3 tons. So I now know that this booster is capable of lifting about 100.3 tons into low carbon orbit. So I go over to my assemblies, grab the booster that I just removed, drop it into the subassembly drop zone. I'm gonna call this one booster 10. If you wanna use more creative names than me, that is of course, not a bad idea. Payload of 100.3 tons to LKO. And now that booster is on my list of all my other boosters. Okay, let's get back to our moon vessel here and see if I cannot find me a good booster to lift this thing. So if I take a look at my engineer report, this thing is 19.274 tons. Okay. And if I take a look at my list here, oh, I got some that go quite a bit over that. And if you want, you can arrange these by cost and that will obviously put the lighter boosters towards the top and the heavier, more expensive boosters towards the bottom. You wanna be able to get up the most payload you can for the least amount of cost. It's really tempting to grab this one here, booster seven, which can lift 28 tons. But remember that a lot, a lot of this fuel, a lot of this mass is actually gonna deal with the top part of the ascent. So I'm actually gonna go Below that, the next one below is this one, booster number eight with 10.9 tons. I'm gonna grab that, stick that on the bottom. Now, as is typical, you might need to do a little bit of cleaning up. Let's scroll this up a little bit. This is a little messy here in the middle. But if I take a look at my stats, is this still on vacuum? It is. I have a delta V, total delta V of 5,050. That feels about ideal. And a thrust to weight of 1.32, ooh, it's 1.21 on the surface. I would like that to be a little higher. Can I get that up to about the 1.33 range if I, oh, 1.43, okay, yep. We have enough thrust, so we have enough thrust, we have enough fuel, clean this up in the middle here, and this should be perfectly fine. So let's clean this up here, uh, let's remove that, let's remove this fairing, it doesn't need to be here. All of these extra reaction wheels I don't need, I got reaction wheels up higher. This is the wrong size decoupler, so we'll pull that off. Let's put on the right size decoupler, the TD-25. Stick this down here on the bottom. That's already quite a lot cleaner. Put this back on vacuum, 5,090, more than enough. I have the thrust that I need. In fact, I'll need to tweak it down to a thrust weight of about 1.33, but otherwise this thing is ready to launch. If you are at this point in your career, I'm going to assume you are already comfortable with getting to orbit. As such, the bulk of what remains of this video will be devoted to rendezvousing station modules around the moon. The one thing I will say about this rocket is, it being so tall, it will want to pitch over more quickly than other rockets in this series. To counter this, you may want to wait a little longer before knocking it towards the east, thus going up more steeply. Other than that, just fly this like any other rocket. Don't forget, we will be doing two rendezvous about the moon. The second of the two will bring up the crew. As for that vessel, it is almost exactly the same vehicle I used in my EVA construction video. The only thing I did was replace the 0.625 meter Clampatron Jr. with its bigger 1.25 meter cousin. As for the crew, Bill you know, but we also have our two pilots required by the contract, Mark VD and Adam W. 
both rescued using, once again, this exact vehicle in missions that don't require any skills that I haven't talked about in previous tutorials. And if the names don't sound very kerbally, that is because they are named after just two of the wonderful people that directly support this channel. Speaking of which, I'm going to take this opportunity to welcome aboard my most recent YouTube members and Patreon patrons, Jason Lee, Calvin McCarney, Aphis, Technical Support, and TFSM389. As always, a special thank you goes out to all of my most awesome supporters. And with our station module now in orbit, we need to get it to the moon. Not just that, but we need to somehow rendezvous it with this station in its polar orbit about the moon. Now, polar orbits are nothing new to this series. Not only did I do it last episode, I also did it way back in this episode. But to quickly recap, all I gotta do is adjust my injection burn to hit the moon smack dab in the middle. And then what we're gonna do is make a mid-course correction to pull this trajectory so that we're not hitting the moon and we can go into a polar orbit. But if we're gonna rendezvous with this station, we're going to have to eventually end up in the same plane as this orbit, this orbit of the station. And you can see right now, there's actually a substantial angle here. And in fact, you can look at the AN and DN and see that that angle is 70.6 degrees. You have two choices. Number one, you can make the plane change once in the moon's SOI. That's the more expensive way to do it. And we're gonna look at that when we bring up our Kerbals. We're gonna look at that a little later in this video. But the cheaper, in fact, the free way to do it is simply to adjust your timing so that you are coming in, already in or very close to being in the right plane. And it's really, really easy to do. Again, right now our, our angle here is 70.6 degrees between our incoming trajectory and the orbit that we want. If I pop ahead in orbit, notice that that messes this up a little bit. And if I get in here and just kind of play with the timing, I can get it back till I'm hitting right in the middle. And I take a look here and I notice the angle has changed. It's now up to 75.4 degrees. So I didn't add in any delta V here. I never changed the amount of the burn at all. I simply did the burn a little bit later, one orbit later to be precise. Why does that change this angle? Well, it's because the moon is an orbit about Kerbin. But this orbit here, the orbit of our station is remaining stationary thanks to conservation of angular momentum. Its plane remains stationary in relation to the stars. So as the moon orbits and this orbit remains oriented the same way in space, it's going to give the impression that this orbit is actually changing. It's going around the moon in this way. It's not, but it, from our perspective, it looks like it is. So all we have to do is go forward enough in time so that our incoming trajectory is right along the plane that we want. And you do that by simply hopping ahead orbit. So I went one orbit, that made a little bit of a change. Let's go five orbits, one, two, three, four, five. And then we adjust the timing, don't adjust the prograde retrograde part. Maybe I'll up the number of seconds here a little bit. Don't adjust the prograde retrograde part, just the timing, because we don't want to change how much the burn is. And now our angle is 98. It's moving in the right direction. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. And you just keep doing this until you're as close to getting it in the plane that you want. Uh, 177 point. Again, I'm shooting for 180, so that's only 2.3 degrees off. That is going to be trivial to deal with once we are at the moon. So now, just by waiting another couple of days, we will have to make barely any inclination change at all. Of course, once we've completed this burn, we have to still perform a mid-course correction on our way to the moon. The one thing to be careful of here is to make sure this correction is in the right direction. In my case, I need to come to the south of the moon so that the new module will be coming in going in the same direction as the station in its orbit. You can tell by taking a look at the AN or DN with the target orbit. You want the relative inclination close to zero. If it's close to 180 degrees, that means you are going in the opposite direction of your target, which is bad to say the least. Other than that, your goal is to have your incoming trajectory just touching the target orbit, ideally at the AN or DN. 
As for the rendezvous itself, now that our incoming trajectory is more or less in the same plane as the target orbit, this is no different than the rendezvous I did about the moon in a previous tutorial. To go over the main points, you want to set up a retrograde burn where your trajectory touches the target orbit. Use this burn to get your closest approach as small as you can. If the close approach indicators aren't moving, then move the maneuver ahead at 1 second intervals until you see the approach indicators jump. Once set up, perform the burn and then rendezvous and dock with the target. If you need a hand with docking, check out this video. But even with these modules together, we still need our crew here to complete the contract. So let's get to them and take a look at another way to perform this rendezvous. This time, we're just not going to wait around. We're going to perform the lunar injection at our first opportunity. We still want to go into a polar orbit, so again, the injection burn aims straight at the moon. And then we perform a similar mid-course correction as the last time to have our incoming trajectory come in over one of the moon's poles. Even though we aren't matching planes with the target orbit, we still want to pay attention to inclination relative to the target. This angle will always be either above or below 90 degrees. We can choose which one by coming in over either the north or the south pole. Choose the pole that gets the smaller inclination. Here I went north to get a relative inclination with the target of 84 degrees, close to as bad as this is ever going to get. I then set my periapsis with the moon to 50 kilometers, the same altitude as the target station. Now we get ourselves to the moon's SOI. So again, we're going to get a capture here, but we also need to make this rather monstrous plane change. And if you're going to have to do a big plane change, you are much better off doing that plane change as far from the parent body as you can get. Because the further out you are, the slower you're going and the cheaper both normal and radial burns will be. So I do want to get a capture, there's no doubt about that. But what I want to do is keep that ascending node, you can see it right here, out as far as I can. So I'm going to, whoop, that is not a capture. So we're going to bring it back just like that. And we're just going to capture ourselves into this rather large elliptical orbit. And once we perform the capture, go back out to map view and put a maneuver on, well, it's either going to be the AN or the DN. In my case, it's the AN, whichever one is the furthest away. And actually, let's right click on the DN so we can see our relative inclination with the target. So now what we want to do is pull on one of the two normal vectors, whatever brings it down. And you're going to find that as you do this, you also are pushing out your orbit, you can see that, so you're also going to have to give yourself a respectable amount of retrograde at the same time to keep that periapsis close by. So it's a combination of normal and retrograde, and I won't deny it, it's a bit fiddly. In fact, as you close in on the end of big plane changes like this, you'll find that the prograde retrograde direction may affect the orbital plane as much, if not more, than the normal direction. But after a bit of fiddling, I got an inclination difference of only 0.7 degrees, with my periapsis just touching the target orbit. But this burn cost me 300 meters per second of delta V. Remember, in the first technique, we got this plane matching for free just by waiting an extra couple of days. Either way, after performing the burn, our orbits were now in the same plane, so we can perform the rendezvous using the exact same technique as before. The end result of both techniques is the same, so in the end, the 300 meter per second plane change saved us a couple of days of waiting. This wait, by the way, is never more than half the period of the moon's orbit, which is only three days. So you may be asking yourself, why bother doing this second way at all? Well, maybe you are playing with life support mods and time is at a premium, but a more likely scenario is that you are doing the same kind of rendezvous, but about Minmus. With Mimis's longer orbital period, the necessary wait to match planes could be as much as 25 days. Moreover, with Mimis's lower gravity, the cost of the plane change maneuver will be much, much less than the moon anyway. Either way, it's nice to have more than one technique so you can pick the one that works best for your situation. And as Mark, Bill, and Adam get used to their new home, why don't I go over the main takeaways from this episode? 
During the build, I showed you how to use structural fuselages to construct a multi-node hub. You can do much the same thing with structural girders too. Also during the build, I showed you how to use the sub-assembly feature in the game to create a booster library. Having pre-made boosters to attach to payloads can significantly cut down on your build times. We then looked at performing rendezvous with an object in a polar orbit about the moon. We looked at two techniques, one that minimizes fuel use while the other minimizes time. The final thing I did with this station was have Bill EVA and shore up the docking port connection to the fuel module with a handful of struts. Docking ports tend to be wobbly and this does a great job of making the station more rigid. And speaking of EVA construction, in the next video I will be returning to my Minmus base to construct a fully functional rover out of the parts I brought there. I hope to see you then.